It's a week when the financial world stopped to catch a breath and watch Greece. Just when the Greek crisis that has been the big shadow over Europe was threatening to pass over after a series of meetings and a bailout package on the 27th of October. Days later, Greek Premier George Papandreou decided to throw a spanner in the works and ask for a referendum. To go to his angry people to vote for the bailout and new austerity measures it would bring. What's more, to force his own government to back him, he even said he will test his thin strength in Parliament. All in all, after suspenseful days, it seems the storm has passed. Greece still has its bailout deal. But is all well? What next? That's what we asked world-renowned economist Pankaj Khemavat. Greece on its own has all kinds of issues as well. And uh, the thing that frightens me the most is that if you talk to people within Greece, there is this tremendous tendency to blame all their problems on outsiders when it's clear, for instance, that Greek needs a significant number of internal reforms. Sure. There is zero appetite for those internal reforms. And absent those internal reforms, it's a little bit hard to see how even under the best of circumstances, Greece is going to start growing again, which is what would be needed for even the reduced debt load to be something that they could bear. Mm. There are lots of figures moving out of Greece. There are a lot of figures about the real haircut that the banks are taking because of Greece. One view is that it's far more than 50 percent. It's actually 75 percent and closer to that. And this will really sour things for the other countries like Italy, which are high on debt. Because why would a bank want to lend to Italy or take sovereign debt of Italy when they know that tomorrow if Italy is in trouble, they could be forced to have a haircut there too. So what is wha how do you see the banking side of the story emerge? Well, uh, the banking side of the story is very, very murky because nobody, with the possible exception of the European Central Bank, really knows what's been going on. On the one hand, there's the haircut that the banks are going to have to take. On the other hand, since the beginning of the year, the amount of uh, Greek debt that's been transferred from the banks to the ECB is very, very substantial. So they're taking zero haircut on that. It's just Europe's taxpayers that are left to bear the burden. Now, Italy is uh, a very, very different country from Greece. Uh, Italy, actually, of all the countries in the world, has the highest savings per household of any country in the world. Mm. Italy is a very rich country that's been very poorly run. Uh, the Italians distrust their financial system, so a lot of this wealth is sort of kept not literally under the mattress, but is outside the banking system. In terms of whether the Italians have the ability to pay off their debt, for sure they do, unlike Greece. The trouble in Italy is as much misgovernance and mismanagement by the government as it is a fundamental financial crisis in terms of a country being unable to meet its foreign obligations. Let me ask you, you know, this is uh, an economist paradise, really, because uh, all the theories are being challenged, all new theories are emerging. But um, if you were to take a step back and, and look at how this particular month or the last couple of months will impact the growth process in Europe and how it will impact the banks out there, what can you glean right now? I, I would um, make the perhaps somewhat controversial statement that Europe, what happens with Europe's growth is not necessarily tied to wh what, what is in the interest of Europe's banks. Mm. Right now, the banks are, many of them are wobbling at the edge of insolvency. They don't want to accept bailouts because that would dilute their existing equity holders. So they keep insisting that they can tough it out mm -hmm. without requiring any dilution of their existing equity holders. And when I look at Europe now, the image that comes to mind is Japan, where zombie banks kept on life support, advancing no credit to the rest of the economy, basically manage, have managed to create two decades of stagnation in what was once a very wi vibrant economy. So one way or another, the financial structure sector has to be restructured to the point where credit starts flowing again, mm. which is not what's going to happen if all the banks are hanging on by their fingernails to, the, to meet That's the basic capital adequacy ratios. That's interesting. You see the parallel ratios. more with Japan than with U.S. post Lehman? Uh, yes. I think that, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, I think that uh, 
the rigidities in Europe are such that I really worry much more about a Japanese kind of we'll just get frozen into certain patterns of low growth. Mm. Whereas the U.S. economy, for all its many faults, and it does have many faults, has always had a greater ability to redeploy resources from less productive mm. uses to more productive uses. But you know, uh, Europe is interesting because they are very, very aggressive nations within that. And I think the latest crisis is brought to the fore the fact that Angela Merkel and Germany have perhaps emerged as the strongest players within the Eurozone. If there is a decade of no growth and a lost decade, would it kind of facilitate the breaking up of the Eurozone? Because why would Germany be want to part, be part of it? Germany is, a, is one of the economies that has grown, even in the worst times. It's, it's got a great base to you know, take off from, and they are powerful right now. Well, I, I mean, I think that there's certainly a strain within Germany that thinks that. I think that the more thoughtful elements within Germany recognize that a lot of what's happened is Germany growing at the expense of the rest of the Eurozone. You have to remember that the structure of trading relationships is such that roughly two-thirds of Germany's exports go to the rest of the Eurozone and only one-third to the rest of the world. So while we think of Germany as this big global export powerhouse, Germans themselves are often surprised when you show them the data on how dependent Germany is on the Eurozone. So and that's what Germany would be walking away from if, in fact, they decided that they effectively wanted the Deutschmark back. Mm -hmm. And Merkel, despite running into huge political trouble, has so far had the courage to resist those calls. But there certainly are German politicians right now who are effectively calling for a union of like-minded northern European countries that might or might not include the French but essentially going back to the Deutschmark. Mm. So is, uh, you know, I've been asking this question for some time. Everybody's been debating it, uh, you know, for a long time. Is this the end of the Eurozone as we know it? Or do you think mm. it's, it's an <coughs> important stage in the evolution of, of the concept? Well, I think uh, it still remains to be determined. I think a lot depends on um, how intelligently or unintelligently policymakers play the hands they've been dealt. But having said that, I think it's easier to imagine the end of the Eurozone than it was not that long ago. Companies too are trying to figure out what do we do with this money? We don't have enough confidence to invest. On the other hand, every currency we can think of is potentially treacherous and so pity the poor or rather the rich corporate treasurer who has this problem of figuring out where to park the money that companies are unwilling to invest.